My name is John Rogers, and I'm very pleased to be here today. Really, as it's one of those things, we, we've all done many of these over the years, and China is so vast, there's so many opinions, so many people have had such extraordinary experiences, that when I come to this, not only am I validated in some of my beliefs, but I'm challenged in others, and I hear remarkable stories. So it's a pleasure to be here for nothing other than that. We're here talking about regional strategies, and in part, it's a follow-on to Professor Li, who was talking about outbound Chinese investment, Chinese FDI, coming out into the world, some of Scott Kennedy's remarks in the last panel, and the like. I'm here today as president of the Midwest U.S.-China Association. I do have a day job. I practice law in Chicago. I uh, teach in China. I do a couple of other things. We have some businesses in China. And it's so energizing to be part of that. But one of our givebacks, one of the things that we were wanting to do is to support the Midwest in its effort at economic development. The Midwest U.S. China Association will soon be in existence five years. And about five years ago, Adley Stevenson called me and said, if I'm going to be the timekeeper, I better keep my own time too, called me and said, uh, you know, you're interested in doing this. You know, I'd uh, been in China and looked at outbound FDI. And if you recall the chart that Professor Lee put up there in 2004, 2004, outbound Chinese investment was just starting to happen after the Go Global policy announced in 2000, 2001. The, and, and basically I told Senator Stevenson I was busy, I didn't really have time for this. And the next thing I know, I was out talking to economic development people throughout the Midwest and getting reacquainted with my own Midwestern roots, which were from Pike County, Illinois. I've been, uh, been absent for a number of years, uh, spending the last 20 years in and out of Asia, but it was really a pleasure to get back to my roots here in the Midwest. And one of the things that has uh, come to our uh, attention is that we really do hide our light under a bushel here in the Midwest. We have extraordinary resources that I want to talk about in a second. But in terms of attracting foreign investment, we really haven't done a great job of getting out there and doing it. And we're trying to, to support that as well. A little more on the history. As I said, Senator Stevenson, uh, in part because of his long history in working with Japanese investment coming into the Midwest, has moved to the China side of it. And the Japanese investment and investment patterns into the Midwestern part of the United States were very significant, starting in the 60s, 70s, and into the 80s. At one time, over a quarter of a million people in the Midwest worked directly for Japanese companies. In my home state of Illinois, we had over 55,000 people working directly for Japanese companies at the peak of that uh, investment pattern. And here in the state of Indiana, as you well know, you have all three. You're the only state that has all three of the Japanese transplant automakers with assembly plants in the state of Indiana. And for that, you're, you're to be congratulated. The similar economic dynamic of unsustainable imbalance of trade and accumulation of foreign reserves that we experienced with the Japanese and caused, in part, Japanese investment into the United States and worldwide was one that we thought we could duplicate with the Chinese. But again, as Professor Lee has told you, that has not happened in any great regards here in the United States. In 2004, about 6 to 8 percent of Chinese outbound investment came to North America. The professor's number was 3 percent coming here uh, last year. I think if you take out some of the financial numbers, investments into financial firms, that number would be significantly less. Uh, there's a lot of reasons for that. So Scott Kennedy has uh, enumerated some of them with Cepheus and others. But part of it is we haven't made a good effort regionally to support our request for investment. That's what we try and do as a volunteer group with the Midwest-U.S.-China Association. When we first started uh, and, and continuing to today, we have the China Council for the Promotion of International Trade as our partner, and they have been very supportive. Uh, for those of you who have worked in China, understand the speed of China, you would appreciate this. Uh, four and a half years ago, five years ago, uh, I believe it was July of 06, or excuse me, July of 04, when we uh, decided to form this organization, you know, the, the Chinese wanted to hold a conference, we wanted to hold a conference. We were consulting with some of our Japanese colleagues, and they said, oh, a conference like that would take 18 months to plan and, and, and take off. And I turned to my Chinese colleagues and I said, you want to do September in three months? And we pulled off a, a very successful first conference in Beijing, and thanks in large part to Chairman Wang Jiefi and the people at CCPIT. 
We are an education group, as I see us. We try and promote the Midwest. And you've heard this here today that the Midwest is often a flyover area for Chinese, that people don't understand the import of the region nor its existence oft times. They come to California, they go to the East Coast. I was going to tease Vincent uh, Mo um, when he brought his people over to look at real estate investment, even though he's a Hoosier and even though he's a uh, Indiana University graduate, he didn't even bother to come to Chicago. He took him to the West Coast and the East Coast. The, uh, but we get people here, they understand that we have an economy approximately the size of Germany. It would be the fifth largest economy in the world if we were a standalone country as this region. We have extraordinary universities, research universities, and we're privileged to be part of that here today. But Jiao Tong University in Shanghai did a survey of hard science universities in the world, in the world, and they, they discovered that 38 of the top 100 are in the Great Lakes region of the United States. And our plea is to leverage off this, to work in this, to, to use this base that we have developed here in the Midwest as a tool to attract foreign inbound investment and to cooperate with the Chinese. When we talk about uh, educational requirements or what we do, we have presentations uh, that describe the Midwest, all the states of the Midwest, the 12 states of the Midwest, that we present in China and, of course, on our website. We've gone to Shaman for the last several years to the large uh, China International uh, Fair for Investment and Trade, CFIT, in uh, Shaman, to uh, make these presentations. Three years ago when we were there, we were the only group in North America making a presentation at the largest trade and investment fair in China. Uh, last year there were a couple of others. Many of the states show up, a few of the states have booths, and we congratulate them for that. But we really do have to step up and make a better effort to explain the United States, but particularly our region, to the Chinese. The infrastructure that we have here in the Midwest is extraordinary. Uh, there's a uh, study from Chicago that tells you you can cover 65% of the North American economy in a one-day truck drive from Chicago, and about 85% of the North American economy in a two-day truck drive from Chicago. Chicago and Indianapolis close enough, you get the picture. But if a Chinese company wants to distribute in the United States, what better place than Indianapolis, Chicago, Bloomington, Illinois? And Bloomington, Illinois brings me to the other point that I want to make about a regional approach. Uh, Mayor uh, Armstrong and I were talking about this earlier. We all have our own self-interest. We all like the investment to come. We'd like the jobs to be, you know, in our backyard, and that's fine. But there is a regional impact, and this was really brought home to me in the early 90s when Mitsubishi built an assembly plant in Bloomington, Illinois. At that time, I was a lawyer in Chicago. I represented the transportation company, and we all know about just-in-time inventory, that uh, tomorrow's production for a, an auto plant that's efficient is basically on the trucks today. And those trucks were coming in to Bloomington, Illinois, on a daily basis from eight states and two Canadian provinces. So that's the sort of regional impact that a major investment can have. It's not just in your community, it's not just in your state, but it's within your region. And collectively, we can use the region, the strength of the region, to leverage off each other's assets to build a, uh, uh, the opportunity to cooperate here. Uh, one last regional effort that uh, many people don't know about, uh, Council General uh, Wang Ping was here this morning. Many of you heard him. We were in St. Louis several months ago at the opening of the Confucius Institute. And Council General was talking about the big idea that St. Louis has come up with. Last year, about this time, uh, our Vice Chairman, uh, Governor Bob Holden, the former Governor of Missouri, with the then Governor Matt Blunt, uh, both United States Senators, two Congressmen, the Mayor of St. Louis, and the County Executive of St. Louis County, all went to China to solicit Air China's cargo hub to be located actually on the Illinois side of the Mississippi River across from St. Louis. They've recently announced a commission and got a $2 million grant to fulfill that. When we had the strategic economic dialogue in the U.S. last May, the Vice Premier stopped in St. Louis uh, together with the Chinese ambassador to further those discussions. But that's the sort of regional thinking that I believe we need if we're all going to survive in this. Uh, with that, I will tell you that we have a distinguished group of speakers here, all of whom have their own stories about regional strategies that we can share that uh, I look forward to hearing as well. And we're going to start with Steve Eckert from the, a card from the uh, 
Director of the International Development for the Indiana Economic Development Corporation. Uh, everyone has their bios in, the, uh, in your package except me. For some reason, they left me out. But uh, that's OK. You can come here to hear me. Uh, so I, in, in the interest of saving time, I won't read the bio, but ask Steve to come to the podium. Thank you. Thanks very much, John. I'm uh, delighted to be here on behalf of the state of Indiana, uh, representing the Indiana Economic Development Corporation. And I'd like to um, talk a little bit about what the state of Indiana is doing generally and more specifically with uh, respect to China. Um, and I also would like to uh, expend, extend, uh, despite the late hour, a special greetings from uh, Governor Daniels, who is very supportive of our efforts uh, to attract business from around the world. Let me start by giving you a couple of quick statistics just on the importance of globalization for the state of Indiana and what it's meant for our economy. By way of background, foreign firms currently have over $37 billion in capital investments in our state, and those investments provide employment for nearly 150,000 Hoosiers. As a state, we've pursued a very deliberate policy of being open to and welcoming foreign investment. John mentioned the success we've had with Japanese investment, and in fact, um, we on a per capita basis have the highest concentration of Japanese employment of any state in the country. We believe those efforts can be replicated uh, in China. At, at lunch, um, Michael reported about some of the statistics on Indiana's exports, mentioning that we have exported in 2008 over $900 million worth of uh, goods to China from Indiana. That's exports, not imports. Indiana exports to China have grown at double-digit rates for more than a decade. And in some cases, uh, some years, that growth rate has been more in the range of 20 to 30 percent per year. What are we exporting? Primarily machinery, chemicals, agricultural components. And in the case of China, particularly metal. Indiana is a leading metal producer, uh, producing state in the country, and that product is often exported to China. You also heard a little bit earlier from Dennis Kelly, who shares a partnership with the state of Indiana, that we established a sister state relationship with Zhejiang province in 1987 through an agreement signed by then Governor Robert Orr and his counterpart at a ceremony here in Indianapolis. The uh, Consul General also verified a little bit earlier this morning how visionary that really was. And he pointed out that uh, Zhejiang is uh, sometimes uh, seen as a few steps ahead of other provinces uh, in China. We share in that assessment. In 1987, the same year that we established the sister state agreement with Zhejiang, Indiana opened a trade and investment office uh, with Dennis Kelly's uh, firm uh, Pacific World Trade in a partnership with them. And Indiana is one of only a handful of states that has had a continuous presence in China now for more than 20 years. I would also note that we are one of a few states in the country which we have to have um, um, uh, a Confucius Institute. In fact, we have three in the state of Indiana including one on this very campus. That's a rare distinction, and we're quite proud of that. As a state, we're in the business on the international front of building relationships. We've heard a lot about building trust and building relationships. We consider that a very important part of our function of even having a representative office in China. And in part, to fulfill that, we've hosted numerous delegations uh, from China over the years, including for the past four years of, of the Daniels administration, at least one, and in some cases more than one, each year, including several from Zhejiang province. We expect, as Dennis mentioned, another one coming over the course of this summer. Our, as a state, we also help uh, coordinate visits to China, not just from the state, but also from communities across the state. Within the past year, We've helped with uh, visiting delegations from the city of Indianapolis. You heard Mayor Ballard mention that earlier today. 
uh, with the city of Gary. Mayor Armstrong will undoubtedly highlight some of uh, his recent uh, uh, visits to China as well. The city of Anderson has also visited, and, and Roy, Roy Budd, I'm sure, will also mention some of the efforts from his region of the state and what they're doing in China. So we've been very supportive of that effort as well, and will continue to do so. Well, Dennis Kelly mentioned a little bit earlier some of our efforts to actively recruit new job-creating investment in the state. And to be blunt, F the foreign direct investment in the state of Indiana has been modest to date. But there are Chinese firms here. The mayor of Indianapolis, Mayor Ballard, mentioned one success story that he found in the distribution side in his visit last uh, December. Um, but I want to point out a couple other significant ones. There are two fairly significant employers in the state of Indiana with Chinese ownership. One is Vanguard Trailer, which is located in Monon, Indiana, and the other is a company called Coupled Products, which is owned by Wan Shang, which we also have heard earlier today is uh, headquartered in Zhejiang Province, our sister state. They're located um, in Columbia City. Most of the large uh, employment efforts like that have come through uh, M&A, merger and acquisition activity, that will, I believe, continue to be the case to some extent. But those two firms alone account for approximately 800 jobs in the state of Indiana. So while the investment has been modest in comparison to, say, investment from Germany or Japan, it is here and is significant. Despite the economic downturn, uh, we are continuing to reach out for foreign direct investment. We will continue to be globally engaged with China specifically. Um, and we have a deliberate strategy to reach out. And we're confident that over the coming years, we will see more investment like the ones I've uh, highlighted. And that will continue to bear fruit for our employment across the state. Why will that be the case? For the same reason that other investment from around the world has been successful here. We have a low cost of doing business. We have a very high standard of living. We have a dedicated and qualified workforce. We have some of the most outstanding universities in the country. And finally, I would point out um, which, uh, a factor that I consider to be extremely important, one we haven't talked about a whole lot uh, today, but in addition to building trust and building relationships, at the state level, we believe it's been very important to have a welcoming atmosphere. That is to say, we want the foreign investment here. There are many states that are not making that message, but we want it to be clear that we do welcome it and that you'll find that foreign firms, including Chinese firms, will find a welcoming atmosphere to their investment in the state of Indiana. So with that, I will pass up the baton to uh, Mayor Armstrong. Mayor Armstrong. Great job, Steve. I probably won't have to say anything, um, but I will. It's great to be here. I listened to the panelists, uh, very knowledgeable panelists. Um, so I will keep within my 10 minutes, I promise you. Um, a little bit about Columbus, Indiana. We're a population of approximately 40,000 people located along I-65, just uh, 40 miles south of Indianapolis. We have had a uh, strategy uh, for several years in the early 80s about foreign investment, which started in, in Japan. We currently have 17 Japanese manufacturing plants in Columbus that uh, provide many jobs for uh, our local citizens. 1996 was my first trip to China. We thought we should investigate, look at that particular area as potentiality for foreign investment. In 1996 in Beijing, uh, if you saw the pictures up here earlier about the, uh, the air quality, uh, I think it was a little worse then than it is now. But at the time, there was one ring road around Beijing, uh, 1465. Uh, around Beijing, and they're working on, I believe, their seventh ring as we speak in that short amount of time. So uh, a large, large opportunity uh, for foreign investment in the United States. About five years ago, we, as an economic development board, which I'm a member, decided that our strategy should look at strictly China. The investment that's 
the, the potential there was uh, quite large. So uh, we have been there now at least once a year for the past uh, five years and sometimes twice a year. Now the good news is we have a great company, Cummins, that is headquartered in Columbus. And as most of you know, you heard earlier today, that have been uh, in China uh, since the 70s and have a huge market share uh, in China, which absolutely helps us in Columbus, Indiana. But the good news is they are really good at helping us uh, when we go to China. We have uh, one of the local uh, uh, employees, Jean Ho, and her husband who go on these trips with us every year and uh, at their expense, knowing that it's going to help our community and uh, in the future probably communities surrounding us. Not only are we thinking about Columbus, Indiana, but our economic development executive director sets uh, on the regional board. Uh, we don't hide our heads in the sand. We want to make sure if we don't win or get every company, we want the state of Indiana to get as many as possible. Don't get me wrong, we'll fight for everything we can get in our community, but we also know that Indiana is a winner uh, if we are able to uh, provide assistance in that particular uh, area also. We've been very blessed. Uh, we uh, have made great uh, strides in relationships. And it's, and it's exactly right. The relationships, cultures mean so much. And I've learned a lot in the few years we visited China. We were fortunate enough to uh, uh, come up with a great sister city. Again, our community of about 40,000, we needed a community about our size. Um, so the city that we picked out, fortunately, had three Cummins plants in it, so we had something in common. And about the same size as Columbus, they're between six and a half and seven million people. But we do have a lot in common. Uh, we certainly do, and so far we've had a great relationship with the mayor uh, visiting Columbus and, and also us visiting Wuxi on several occasions. But as has been said before, and I, I just won't, uh, I guess, repeat, the cultural advantages that you'll receive and the relationships that you, uh, that you gain will profit you in the years to come. Uh, we've had uh, uh, several trips, as I said, uh, to China, all over China specifically the six areas that were shown this morning uh, uh, or this afternoon. But we have come up now with two companies, hopefully three if we can get uh, our deputy mayor to work a little bit harder in that particular area. But we have been blessed uh, so far with the, the type of companies that we have been looking for. And what we've been looking for are basically manufacturing companies, assembly plants, uh, and any type of technology, embedded systems, whatever. Direct uh, competition with some of our locals, but competition is healthy, and uh, we've realized that. As a community, uh, the Chinese strategy has certainly worked. Uh, every year we hold a, an annual um, expo, ethnic expo. We have approximately 45,000 people who attend that expo where there's different cultures from all over the world. Last year, China was the host country and brought in uh, acrobats from, uh, from China, uh, just great food. But you know what? We were able to meet new friends, and those friends were able to meet new friends. So you garner these relationships, and hopefully when we return in September, that we'll be, uh, again, a little fortunate by meeting more and more people that uh, come to trust us, and in turn, we trust them. There are some language barriers. There's no doubt there are language barriers. But you know what? Those are minor barriers. We have to break through those barriers and everyone work together. And so far, in Columbus, Indiana, a small community, uh, we've been very, very fortunate. And uh, we've had a lot of help, again, uh, not only from uh, our citizens, but uh, again, Dennis Kelly from uh, Pacific World Trade has helped us along the way, helping us set up meetings. 
uh, with various companies. Cummins has helped us set up meetings with various companies. And uh, the relationship between uh, ourselves and the government uh, has been nothing but positive. You know, you expect that uh, there will be closed doors, but the doors are open. They're waiting, and they're waiting for mayors and, and uh, also economic development teams to, uh, to show up at their doorsteps. In fact, in the companies that we visited, every single uh, company I will mention, uh, how many mayors have been here to ask that your company comes to the United States and, and invest in the U.S.? And believe it or not, I've been the only mayor that they've talked to from the United States about investment in the United States. Now, China is a big country. Lots of companies, but we also deal with companies in large cities that are pretty well known. So I can only ask that you, if you, whatever city that you are from, that you contact your mayor or have your mayor contact me, be glad to, to help out because it's an investment in the United States is a great investment for all of us. With that, I'm within my 10 minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Armstrong. The, uh, I would now ask uh, Roy Budd to come to the podium. And as you note that uh, Mr. Budd is the Executive Director of Energize ECI. Good afternoon. My name is Roy Budd, Executive Director of Energize ECI, a 10-county regional marketing program for East Central Indiana. And I represent 10 counties, basically from Indianapolis over to the Ohio border up to Fort Wayne down to Richmond, uh, Richmond, Indiana on Interstate 70. So that part of the state is the area that I, re that I represent in terms of uh, investment. And we're certainly looking at foreign investment as part of that overall strategy. When I began to, to do this work about four years ago, we began to look at ways to broaden our, our perspective in terms of foreign investment, and we had been very successful working with the Japanese and other Asian companies. But we thought we began to look at China as a potential opportunity for us in terms of investment strategy. And one of the ways we looked at doing that was to look at our assets that we had here in East Central Indiana and, and throughout the state of Indiana and try to build upon those assets to encourage that type of relationship building with Chinese, with the Chinese people, and with the country of China. And one thing we came back to over and over again was the assets that is really the corner of the realm here in the United States is our higher education system. So we began to look at the, 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 the institutions of IU, Purdue, and Ball State, and we did an analysis of the alumni from China they had graduated and matriculated through those programs at those three universities, working with their alumni offices. We found that the, inter the data was very interesting. Some of the uh, graduates from those institutions that were in key business decision-making positions in China were very relevant to what we were trying to do here in East Central Indiana. For example, once we went through that analysis, we found that the head of the economic development program for the city of Shanghai was a Purdue alum. We also found that the head of the CEO of a, the, of a major med medical supply distribution manufacturing facility in Shanghai was an IU alum. We found that the chief science officer for Guangdong province in Guangzhou was a Ball State alum. We found that the largest toy producer in the world, which one of our colleagues was talking about earlier today, had a son that was a graduate student at Ball State University. So we began to take the list of these contacts and began to make contacts with those individuals in China to cultivate those relationships. We've traveled now several times to China in the past couple of years. In the month of June of this past year, we spent the whole month in, in China visiting 11 different cities and cultivating these relationships that we talked about just a moment ago. And the list goes on. There's over 35 different contacts that we found that we were able to make contact with in China in our visits that had Indiana connections to our higher education system here in this state. We also met with the American Chamber of Commerce that we heard from today at, at lunch. And we met with the Chinese National Chamber of Commerce about opportunities that they saw as well for foreign investment in our state and, and, and certainly in East Central Indiana. And we had found that some states, primarily the western states, have done a better job than we have here in the Midwest, John. 
They've been very active and very in cultivating those relationships, and we need to follow suit in terms of their activities. And we also found in our discussions that the, the Chinese businesses that we talked to were looking for technology from this country. They were looking for more opportunities for higher education experiences, and they were looking for ways to get a better grip of what's going on in our consumer markets here and hopefully become closer to those consumer markets. We began to explore and stimulate ways to, to, to uh, highlight investment opportunities in East Central Indiana by leveraging these relationships, by finding avenues for mutual benefit from all parties involved, and to stimulate interest in our state as well. And what we found time and time again, there were two themes that we came back to, to over and over. And one was a program of ways to leverage our relationship with our higher education systems. As you may well know, Purdue University here in our state has the largest percentage of international students of any university in the country. And a large portion of those international students are, are Chinese. Same thing is true at IU and the same thing is true at Ball State University in Muncie, Indiana. So we begin to look at ways we can cultivate those relationships even more with that type of investment in higher education in our state with Chinese students and Chinese nationals. We also looked at companies like Cummings and others that had, had long-standing relationships with, the, with China, ways that we can leverage those with supply chain analysis as well and see if we can find other ways to cultivate that type of investment. And I'm from Muncie, Indiana, which is just northeast of here a little bit. And we've had a company there, Ball Corporation, that's been investing in China and has a location in several Chinese cities right now. And they started their investment back in 1974. So they have a long-standing relationship, and we're trying to look at the ways we can cultivate those supply chain concepts. The other thing we heard about time and time again is ways to stimulate foreign investment was through a visa program called EB-5. Some of you may be familiar with that or not. But EB-5 is a way to stimulate foreign investment in your state and in your region by encouraging foreign investment to take place in your region by enhancing dual citizenship opportunities to your, to your immigration system. And we found that the number of Chinese investors that we talked to were interested in citizenship here in this country. And one way to expedite that was through the EB-5 program. So we began to explore opportunities to set up at East Central Indiana's EB-5 regional center and we worked with a number of legal f uh, firms to help us do that, to focus on a certain geographic location, East Central Indiana in this case, to promote economic development in that, in that region through foreign investment, and look for ways that we can promote, promote job opportunities and business investment as well. And with the EB-5 program, if you are a Chinese national and you want to invest in our region or our state, if you make a minimum investment of $1 million in our region or our state, and create 10 or more jobs, we will expedite through the immigration system citizenship opportunities for you in this country. Now, that's been taken advantage of by many of our Western states, but our Midwest has been a little slow in adopting that philosophy, John, so we need to take a look at that. But we do think that the EB-5 program is an excellent opportunity to, to stimulate foreign investment here in Indiana, and in my, in my case, East Central Indiana. The whole idea is to blend these business relationships to, to the point where it truly is a global competitive environment that we're working in. We've had some successes. One of the people we met with in, in Hong Kong just recently, and we met with him now several different times, one of our past panelists was talking about the toy manufacturer. Well, this particular individual is the largest toy manufacturer in the world. He's located in Hong Kong and it has over 6,000 in, in employees there in the, the Shanghai area of China. He's looking at setting up a major distribution center here in the United States and hopefully it will be in the Midwest and hopefully it will be in Indiana and hopefully it will be in East Central Indiana if we have our way about it. But he, he's been very successful and he's very interested in Indiana for a couple of different reasons, for very intangible reasons. One, our geographic location being the crossroads of America, but more importantly to him is that his son is an MBA student at Ball State University. So he's been here many times and he knows the state of Indiana very well. And his number two person with his company is an is a IU graduate from Greensburg, Indiana, who has a great deal of confidence and trust in. So those are the types of relationships we want to cultivate and build to help pursue Chinese investment in our country. And as Steve mentioned to you, our state's very welcoming. 
We encourage foreign investment in this state, and we're looking for ways that we can cultivate that even more so. Having said that, my timekeeper is waving something at me at this point in time, and I appreciate your, your attention. Thank you, Roy. Our last speaker on the panel, and we're waiting for, uh, uh, with great anticipation to his remarks, is Professor Tao from uh, St. Young University. Thanks for Mr. Rogers. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm from Zhejiang University School of Economics. Today, I would like to talk about the double level managerial structure of the market e economy in China. Undoubtedly, China today has a certain form of market e economy. It's an economy different from that of that of US, of Euro, Europe, of Japan, and the government of China boasts it as socialist market economy. As far as I can understand, this economy features with its double level managerial structure. On the upper level, comes the government. It, it operates certain monetary activities, leads, promotes, controls, and guarantees the whole economic system. On the lower level comes the millions of private business and corporations. They are guided nourished and controlled by the government and compete with their counterparts on the market. Now I would like to elaborate on my double level managerial structure theory with the, with the example of relation between local government and local economy. Generally speaking, the market economy in China consists of two levels of grand systems, the one controlled and run by the central government and the other by the local governments. Furthermore, each local eco economic system features with its double level monetary structure and two types of monetary activities. First comes in the monetary activity of the local government who serves the role of an entrepreneur planning, developing, and attra attracting investment for the entire district and its administration. By doing so, local government optimizes its industrial structure and fosters the key business and companies in the hope of speeding up economic growth and bringing more financial income. income. Second comes in the activities of private corporations and business including foreign companies. They utilize the land, infrastructure, and investment environment private, privated by local government, carry out business activities, and turn in taxes and rents to the local government. These two types of entities and activities make the double level managerial structure. We could compare this double level managerial structure to the shopping mall business mode, where the owner plans, invests, and runs the mall as a whole, but doesn't engage in the business of each 
individual shop and counter. The owner is more concerned with creating present shopping environment and conditions that promotes sales in order to attract shop owners to move in. Its revenue comes from the rents and parts of the sales by each shop. Therefore, within this shopping mall, one can expect double structure. Owner of the mall is resp responsible for the general organization and each individual shop for its own business. Each local economy is comparable to this double structured shopping mall, shopping mall mode, and it is those various local economies that make up the China economy as a whole. In a nutshell, I would like to say that the China's economy has not only resulted from business and cooperative activities, but also from government investment and management. Thus, its growth does not only depend on the innovation capacity of each and every enterprise, but also on the ability of management and innovation of the governments. It's about 5 p.m. in Beijing. Uh, I saw that I have been sleeping on bed by now <laughs> in Hangzhou, China. Uh, thanks for coffee. I found myself standing in front of respectable audience and talking about my research. Uh, you are welcome to raise any critics, but bear in mind, it's my dream talk. <laughs> Thank you very much.